Welcome to Al TV's Israel Daily. I'm Amita Rari, and coming up in today's newscast. Israel mourning the murder of the Aniv brothers, settlers rioting while manhunt for terrorists continues. Meantime, CIA chief expressing his concern about Iran's nuclear program advancing at worrisome pace. And your flights to East becoming much shorter from now on with first Israeli commercial flights entering a new airspace. Victims of yesterday's terror attack in Khuara were today laid to rest. 22-year-old Hillel Yaniv and his 20-year-old brother Yagel Yaniv from Harbracha were shot to death by a terrorist gunman as they were driving through the Palestinian town in Samaria. The brothers were pre- and post-army yeshiva students. Hillel was a student in Kiryat Shmona in northern Israel, had recently completed his military service in the Israeli Navy, and was set to resume his yeshiva studies. Yagel Yaakov was a student at the Givat Olga Hesder Yeshiva, had been helping his yeshiva open up a branch in Tirata Carmel and was set to begin his pre-induction process ahead of his formal draft into the army. According to witnesses, the terrorist gunman approached the Anif's car and fired 10 to 15 rounds at a point-blank range before fleeing the scene. The attacker fled the scene and the manhunt is underway. Knesset member Danny Danon visited the scene and called for an increase in deterrence. Two innocent Israelis were massacred in their car in the village of Hawara, that we see behind us. Unfortunately, the terrorists continue to attack innocent Israelis. We will not be silent. We will do everything in our power to protect our citizens. We will make sure that Israelis will be able to live safely here in the land of Israel. Defense Minister Gallant ordered the military to ramp up operations in Judea and Samaria, and forces were bolstered with the aim of expanding defensive operations on the roads and near settlements. Khawara sits on Highway 60 and Israelis regularly travel through the town to reach Jewish settlements in northern Samaria. The string of Palestinian terror attacks leaving 11 Jews dead and more severely injured. Over 60 Palestinians have been killed since the beginning of the year, most of them while carrying out terror attacks or clashes with security forces. Hours after the terror attack in Khawara, Israelis from nearby settlements began descending on the town. For several hours, they attacked Palestinian houses and cars. There was also gunfire and one Palestinian man was killed. LTV Steve Leibovitch reports. Security forces were apparently caught off guard and did not anticipate the large number of settlers who would arrive in Huara to seek revenge. Settler residents of nearby Jewish communities descended on the town, clashed with local residents, and set fire to houses and cars. Flames rose over the town. Security forces arrived on the scene, but it took a long time for calm to be restored. As the attacks were continuing, Prime Minister Netanyahu and other officials called for calm and demanded that settlers not take the law into their own hands. <laughs> Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said he held the Israeli government fully responsible for the attacks. Hawara sees regular friction between Palestinians and settlers. Palestinian sources said some 30 homes and cars were torched. The rampage by Israeli settlers sparked swift and severe criticism at home and abroad, along with calls for Israel to take tougher action against settler violence. As some settlers rampaged in Tchwara, others converged on the evacuated Samaria outpost of Eviatar. Last night, they vowed to resettle the hilltop in response to the deadly attack. 
The outpost has been empty since 2021, when residents left as part of a deal with the government to not demolish their homes while the state carried out a survey to determine what parts of the hilltop are under private Palestinian ownership. Israel is mourning the murders of Hillel and Yagel Yaniv as Israel is going through a very dark reality. And we're pleased to have settler activist Israel Medad with us to tell us more. Israel, Har Bracha, small community, family destroyed. It's a huge, huge loss. Did you know the family or what more can you tell us about the situation from your uh, personal experiences? Well, I happen to be very familiar with the uh, grandfather, uh, Rabbi Yaniv, who was a prominent figure in the Gibat Shmuel neighborhood uh, near Ramat Gan, a very upscale, in fact, uh, national religious uh, neighborhood. Uh, I know Habracha well. In fact, I happened to be many, many years ago uh, on the day that it was founded, uh, facing off uh, Peace Now demonstrators. At the time they left, the community stayed, it's grown, and it's been very successful uh, in dealing with uh, both economic security and cultural and religious uh, themes of light in the land of Israel. Now, this area is prone to terror attacks. Nothing new, unfortunately. One of the brothers just a few days ago said he isn't afraid of the Khawara area. What's the sense of security there, there in the whole area right now? Well, Khawara is a very difficult situation because literally you go through the center of town, a fairly narrow, uh, I don't even think it's uh, two lanes anymore, uh, and there are houses and stores all along the uh, the route of about a kilometer to two kilometers down the road. And it's just too inviting. And ever since Hamas made, I think, a strategic decision to concentrate in northern Samaria, both in Jenin and the Shem Nablus area, uh, the level of stones and firebombs and uh, even shootings, of course, have increased dramatically, uh, according to the figures I just checked, uh, over 7,000 incidents, uh, large and small, happened in uh, the past year of 2022. And it's making uh, things very unnerving un and very difficult for normal life to go on. So what are people actually feeling? I mean, what's the sense? Can people just drive through the city there, through the area? I mean, why did they actually, why were they there actually? if it's that dangerous? Uh, from the communities of Yitzhar, Habracha, one or two others, Itamar, it's impossible to go anywhere, north or south, except through Khawara. Uh, previous governments have planned uh, a bypass. I understand that Miri Rega, who has now returned to the Ministry of Transportation, is uh, dusting off the plans and trying to get the budget for it. Very simply, a little bit of effort, a little bit more time uh, and money spent on this and the whole town could have been uh, neglected and the road gone by. What that does for the local Arab economics, that's their problem uh, because of the fact of the violence. And I think that the handing out of candies immediately after the murders yesterday was one of the triggers or an additional trigger that really set everything off. Interesting. Now, Israel, on a more personal note, don't you think the riots yesterday only interrupted the IDF's ability to find the terrorists? The rage is totally understandable, but isn't there another way? Understandable or not, uh, I definitely do not agree with uh, unrestrained, uh, out of uh, uh, government supervised, shall we say, violence or use of force. I don't think any of the riots will solve anything. Uh, I think people should be stronger in their beliefs about uh, staying in the land of Israel and facing up to Arab, uh, Arab uh, violence without the need to set up fire uh, homes and, and kick old women out. Uh, that doesn't answer anything. It doesn't respond properly to the uh, situation. Pressure, if any, should of course be brought on the government. Uh, the government is uh, more right than center anymore. And I think that the politicians uh, should be pressured uh, to respond uh, more effectively, more stringently, more powerfully uh, to the terror threat they have because it could only get worse and it will not restrain itself or keep itself only in Judea and Samaria 
or in the Jerusalem area, uh, but it will uh, flow over into uh, what we call pre-67 Israel. Israel, it's a very important message coming out here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yesterday's secretive summit in Aqaba brought Israeli and Palestinian officials into the same room for the first time in years. The U.S. brokered effort to restart security cooperation came amid the current surge in violence. LTV's William Sharon reports. No footage has yet to come out from yesterday's summit in Jordanian port of Aqaba, and it's unclear what. If anything, the sides agreed to the point that the U.S. intended meeting was to bring Israeli and Palestinian officials together in an effort to lower tension and violence ahead of the oncoming Ramadan holiday. In addition to Israel and Palestinians, the U.S., Egypt, and Jordan took part in the talks. A joint statement from the participants following the meeting states that the agreement including an Israeli commitment to stop discussion of any new settlement unit for four months and to stop authorization of any outpost for six months. Shortly after the statement was released, Finance Minister Batsalaz Smotrich tweeted that he knew nothing about the meeting and declared that there will be no settlement freeze, even for one day. Later, Prime Minister Netanyahu issued a statement saying that the settlements will continue according to schedule with no changes. Israel and Palestinians reported agreed to resume security coordination halted during the current wave of violence. Security concerns remain over the overgrowing tensions ahead of the Holy Muslim Month of Ramadan. The meeting at the Red Sea port of Aqaba brought together top Israeli and Palestinian security chiefs for the first time in many years. The head of the Central Intelligence Agency warning that Iran could enrich uranium to weapons grade within weeks, but claiming the United States does not believe Iranian leaders have yet decided to really do so. And joining us now to discuss is former Deputy National Security Advisor in Israel, Professor Chuck Freilich. Professor, so we heard the comment by William Burns made during an interview with CBS News on Saturday. And just as a follow-up, it came after the Bloomberg's report from last week speaking about the UN Atomic Agency finding enriched uh, to 84% uh, purity uranium. What are the latest details and what made CIA chief raise this again right now? Well, I think the fact that they have apparently been caught at the 84% level is worrisome because it's a continuation of their program. The fact is Iran for the last uh, certainly months, if not the year or so, has had enough fissile material for its first bombs. What it has not done, and apparently this has not yet changed, is to go the last step, the weaponization, and it's to put it on a warhead uh, that can fit on a missile. So on the one hand, very worrisome because the enrichment program is continuing, but they seem to be in the same holding pattern, if I can call it that, for the last 15, 20 years when it comes to the warhead. So I think the head of the CIA was expressing the deep concern about the first half of the picture, but it doesn't look like they've changed their policy on the second half as of yet. Now, Burns also saying that the CIA does not yet believe that Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has made the decision to actually build a nuclear weapon, even though Iran is definitely proceeding with obtaining the different components it needs for one. What is it depending upon? What is he depending upon? Well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's 15, maybe it's closer to 20 years that, the, <clears throat> excuse me, that they have not made the political decision to cross this final threshold. And I think that's it's not because they don't want to, it's because they understand that it would be a bridge too far and that it might invite either really uh, truly crippling international sanctions of the kind that they cannot afford, or it might actually invite the Israeli or American attack that they're afraid of. What I'm most concerned about at the moment is that we are so consumed by our domestic uh, difficulties on the judicial, political level, on the economic level, what's happening now, the violence in the West Bank, that the Iranians may decide that this is the time for them to change that policy and to break out quickly towards a, an operational capability. Now, just before we'll go on to the domestic issues in the interview, Burns also expressed concern about the growing partnership between Moscow and Iran. Is it really going beyond the supply of drones and ammunition there? Well, that's a good question. We don't know the answer to that yet. The danger is certainly there. There is an inversion of the traditional Russian-Iranian alliance uh, or the very close relationship that they have had for decades 
where it was always Russia was the big guy on the block and the Iranians needed the Russians. Today, at least for the foreseeable future, the relationship is the opposite. The Russians are in such desperate circumstances that they need the Iranians even more. And the fear is that they can supply them with ballistic, mis uh, with ballistic missile technology and potentially even worse. Uh, they can support them in the nuclear negotiations if they ever begin again, or they could provide them with uh, nuclear technology. And of course, they can support their efforts in Syria. So Israel has some very, very major um, considerations, concerns when it comes to Russia. And that's why I believe uh, with all sorrow, uh, because I would like to be able for Israel to be able to support uh, Ukraine wholeheartedly, I think our policy of caution here has been the appropriate one, and we can't change that. Interesting. Now, what is the U.S. saying? What is Israel saying this week after this interview or since the report came out last week? Saying about, excuse me? About Iran, about the whole new report coming out, that Iran is closer than ever, really, to enriching uranium. Well, again, I think what we saw is really it's an Iranian probing move. Okay, they haven't really done anything dramatically different on the ground. They, they went from 60 to 84 percent. It's not a big deal. And from the 84 to 90, the actual military level is nothing. In point of fact, it turns out you can make a weaker bomb even at the 84 percent level. The question here is, again, I think it's a probing move. They're trying to see what the U.S. and Israel will do about it. The U.S. is preoccupied with the Russia-Ukraine issue and China. Israel's preoccupied, as I said, with our own domestic issues and the, the flare-up, uh, the major flare-up in the West Bank. And they want to see if neither one of us can respond in an effective manner, then maybe they'll decide that this really is the appropriate uh, time to go and break out, in other words, to start the final stage the weaponization of the, they have the fissile material for the bombs already. Professor, so we're trying to stay optimistic. Thank you so much for joining us. There isn't too much room for optimism, but thank you. The coalition is showing signs of willingness to compromise on at least one of the key points of the planned judicial overhaul. Head of the Knesset Law Committee, Simcha Rothman, said he has revised the bill on restricting the High Court's power of judicial review by reducing the court majority needed to strike down legislation. RTV Steve Leibovitch reports. Until now, the Judicial Oversight Bill called for a 15-vote unanimous decision. Rothman is now proposing 12 or 13. The opposition called the proposal a spin, insisting that it still gives the government full control over the Judicial Selection Committee and undercuts its independence. Critics of the legislation argued that requiring all 15 justices to rule unanimously in order to strike down legislation would be the same as annulling judicial review altogether. The legal advisor to the committee argued that no other democracy had such a requirement for the exercise of judicial review. Rothman's revision brings his bill back into line with the bill originally proposed by Justice Minister Yariv Levine. Rothman is still maintaining the swift pace of the government's legal reform agenda. The first reading of the bill in Knesset plenum is expected on Wednesday. Opposition to the legal overhaul is continuing with the largest to date protest this past weekend. Mass protests have been held every week during the past two months. Now protesters are planning a day of struggle with expected disruptions and road blockages around the country on Wednesday. And this day needs some exciting news. Your flights to Thailand and actually anywhere in the East will be shortened significantly now with first Israeli commercial flights entering a new airspace. El Al flight from Israel to Bangkok with 200 passengers and crew on board landed on Monday night after an Israeli plane flew for the first time over Oman and the countries of the Arabian Peninsula. The flight took seven hours and 34 minutes, two and a half hours less than previously. As a reminder, last week a flight permit being received over the skies of Oman for the Israeli airlines. The significant decision coming thanks to the warming of relations between the countries as part of the Abraham Accords and the meaning of the decision being the shortening of flight hours to all eastern destinations and the opening of new destinations such as India, Australia and more.
CEO of El Al, Dina Bental Gnancia, saying El Al is proud to be the first company to connect Israel to the east through the countries of the Arabian Peninsula and to carry the Israeli flag on the tail of its plane above the skies of these countries. This is an unprecedentedly important achievement which allows us to provide a better flight experience to our customers along with the best service. The first flight's pilots praising the historic flight just before takeoff in a video taken from the cockpit, with one of them announcing, we will fly over the Arabian Peninsula over Oman. The Israeli flag will fly over Oman for the first time. Our flight will become shorter by two and a half hours, which is very significant. We're launching the fast line to Bangkok and to the Far East in general. We're very happy and excited to be here. A 400-year-old mikveh dating to the 18th or 17th centuries was discovered in the city of Auschwitz in southern Poland, located right near the most well-known extermination camp built by the Nazis. The remains of the Jewish riddle bath house being discovered during the construction of a parking lot in the town, with the mikveh made out of oak wood being discovered several meters below a brick bathhouse found in January. The archaeologists managed to locate the mikveh, the wooden steps leading to it, and a preserved water tank. The fact that the mikveh is made out of wood makes it very unique in Europe. The announcement of its discovery came about a month after the discovery of a mikveh made of bricks nearby. The two discoveries were found near the memorial park of the Great Synagogue in Auschwitz, located where the town's destroyed main synagogue stood before World War II. The Our Crowd Investor Summit drawing over 9,000 people from over 80 countries in Jerusalem, including delegations and startups and different kinds of fields. In this interview, ILTV is sitting down at the Startup Nation Central booth with VP of Business Development at Startup Nation Central, Jeremy Kletzkin, as he's speaking about their very own Startup Nation Finder platform. We're here at the 2023 Our Crowd Global Investor Summit, and we're at the Startup Nation Central booth, where we're here to learn all about their Startup Nation Finder platform. Let's go take a look. We all know Israel is the home of the startup, but with more than 7,000 of them in the country, it's hard to keep track. Startup Nation Central, a treasure trove of knowledge of Israel's startup ecosystem, is addressing that need with its very own Startup Nation Finder. The Startup Nation Finder is a very strategic project for Startup Nation Central. This is an online platform uh, that to map the Israel ecosystem of innovation. It is probably the most exhaustive database in the world for an ecosystem, mapping the, all the startups, all the VCs, the multinationals, anyone who is part of this ecosystem of innovation in Israel is there on this website called the Startup Nation Finder. As such, the Startup Nation Finder is the most comprehensive platform to engage with the Israeli tech ecosystem. The platform delivers accurate, reliable data on Israeli startups from a broad range of sectors from health to banking to the automotive industry and beyond. And best of all, it's free. It's very exhaustive, so whenever you're an investor or you're a startup, uh, you can find whoever you're looking for there. You can even contact the person, you can understand everything from the founding team, investment rounds in the company, uh, all the information were manually entered by our team of 15 analysts that mapped and talked to people individually in the ecosystem. With just a click of a mouse, comprehensive top quality data about the startup life cycle and macro data about the tech ecosystem, including startup development, capital raised, stages of fundraising and background info is all accessible on the site. 50% of the traffic on the website comes from overseas, so it's a great tool for companies to get exposed to global leaderships in large multinationals and investors. We have over 3.5 million users uh, monthly visiting the website, which is over half a million of individual users uh, using the platforms annually. The platform is more than an encyclopedia of knowledge of Israel's high-tech scene. It's also a meeting place where investors and entrepreneurs can connect and drum up ways to take their business to the next level. From investors seeking new opportunities and deal flow to startups looking for investments and collaborations to international organizations seeking cutting-edge tech innovation, it's all possible with Finder. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected around the country tonight with lows this evening averaging around 13 degrees Celsius or 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow we'll see the sunshine bright as the skies are clear alongside highs of 28 degrees Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our LTV channel, subscribe to our LTV newsletter 
And do not forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.TV, with all of the latest news from the heart of the State of Israel. I'm Amita Rari, be well, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you.